we had to, you know, figure out how to get through this very tough period where so many businesses were cutting costs and, you know, doing layoffs and just freezing all expenses that they didn't see as a must have. And so, uh, it was a very tough period. And in many ways, it was also the best experience because that's where all of the groundwork and all of the sort of foundation building that we had done up until that point of building a really strong culture of building the kind of place where people could be creative and responsive to the uncertainties around us and trusted each other and felt passion and commitment in their work. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, my guest is joining us from Pennsylvania, US, and I'm really excited. This this lady is just amazing. She was the co-founder and for a long time, the CEO of Life Labs Learning. She's an established author. She's a researcher, a writer, and educator. She's written for Psychology Today and um, HBR and uh, a whole bunch of other places. Um, But most importantly, she's also, um, she's working with rescued animals, which just really makes my heart sing. So she's she's just an amazing well writer person. Hey, Tanya, lovely to have you on the show. I am so excited to be here. And as you said that one of these rescued animals decided to make some noise. So I apologize in (laughs) advance, (laughs) but we're bringing you and and your listeners into the thick of my life. So there, there may be some sounds from time to time. I love it. And we do this all live and we deliberately don't cut it. And sometimes my dogs decide that they want to, you know, come into the podcast studio or want to leave the podcast studio or bark at the something or other. So it's all fine. So you've got 21 rescued animals, haven't you? That's right. Yeah. 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 We started off very gradually. And then it just, we ended up moving. I, I grew up, I'm from Ukraine originally, I grew up in New mm-hmm. York City, relatively recently moved to Pennsylvania and for better or worse, got a lot of space, outdoor space, which we then promptly decided to start filling up with animals that needed home. So we have a family of five pigs that lives outside, nine goats. We've got two pigs that live indoors, dogs, a cat. Pigs that live indoors as well. Oh, how cool. (laughs) Oh, I'm actually, I'm going to come visit one day. I've got to see this. It's going to be amazing. (laughs) Yeah. Now, I know that, um, you know, you've you've just recently stepped away from being the co-CEO of the Life Labs Learning, um, Mm -hmm. but you took that business from being a two-man band, right? up to 150 people. Would you like to share with us a little bit of that story and, and you know, even where that idea came from as well? And the, the, from the beginning, if you like. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes, I will try. So the idea actually didn't come from me. It came from my co-founder, Leanne Renninger. She mm-hmm. started a version of Life Labs before I joined that had workshops that were open to the public on what she thought of as kind of the school, the, the skills that you don't get a chance to learn in school. So she was teaching about topics like how do you make small talk really well? Uh, what are, what are wisdom skills, things like that. And she and I actually met because I had another company at the time called Surprise Industries, where I, my background is in psychology. So I had been doing research on surprise psychology and surprise industries. We both created these experiences where you show up and you don't know what you're going to be doing until you get there. Mm. And we would work with companies and think about surprise through the lens of organizational health. Where do you remove unpleasant surprises? Where do you add positive surprises? And Leanne, who started Life Labs, she also was really passionate about surprise psychology, was looking to create a workshop on surprise. And so that's how she found me. We got together. We designed this workshop on surprise psychology, the strangest of topics, and started actually booking corporate clients. My background was more in working with companies. And so over time, we sort of blended our businesses together and more and more the the training, the, the advising piece of it picked up steam. So her expertise was in designing these learning experiences. My expertise was in the kind of B2B organizational uh, development and working with, you know, corporate clients side of it. So my job was to kind of grow the business into this B2B shape out of the B2C shape that it had before. So I wish I had like a nice, simple story, a linear path. (laughs) It was a very strange um, kind of windy road into becoming part of this organization. It was the two of us, uh, the year one. And then, uh, seven years later, when I was ready to step out of the CEO role, we were about 150 people. We at that point reached about, uh, 1,500 clients. You know, when I joined, we were three clients. So it was quite the adventure. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> and so um, you've obviously, you're still involved in that role, aren't you? So you're doing a lot of the, the, the you're doing the chair of the board and things like that. What do you yeah. think were the, the, the things you've been most proud of throughout that journey? Because I mean, that's a, it's a huge journey and there must have been some really great highs, but also some, some challenges along the way. What are you oh, most yeah. proud of? 
Sure. One of those challenges is called 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but, and, and actually maybe the, the highs and lows in, in many ways go hand in hand. Like if I think about the toughest year we had for sure was 2020, as I'm sure many businesses did. Um, we were at that point, 70% of the, the, so we do leadership development manager training and about 70% of our business was in person. And then the pandemic hit and we had to switch everything very, very quickly to virtual workshops. Uh, we had to, you know, figure out how to get through this very tough period where so many businesses were cutting costs and, you know, doing layoffs and just freezing all expenses that they didn't see as a must have. Hmm. Yep. And so uh, it was a very tough period. And in many ways, it was also the best experience because that's where all of the groundwork and all of the sort of foundation building that we had done up until that point of building a really strong culture, of building the kind of place where people could be creative and responsive to the uncertainties around us and trusted each other and felt passion and commitment in their work, you just saw this incredible sort of rising up uh, within the team of people going, well, okay, well, we can't do this thing anymore. So let's come up with this other business idea. And, and people just, you know, job titles didn't matter. And, you know, how long people had been there didn't matter. People just really came together and were so um, agile and responsive and inspiring, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, and those were the, the absolute best moments is seeing that it really took on a life of its own, the culture, the, the people co-created it and really mm -hmm. made it into this flourishing entity, you know, that, that I couldn't even wrap my head, my, my hands around anymore because they, they turned it into what it was. Uh, and seeing that, that evolution was incredibly inspiring. Oh, that's wonderful. And you obviously in the middle of all of this, growing a business and going for this, you wrote a book as well. Um, and the book, I've just lost the title, of oh, the, uh, the Leader Lab, that's right, The Leader Lab. So tell us, um, you know, what where that came from and why you wanted to do that. Yeah, so it's called The Leader Lab, Core Skills to Become a Great Manager Faster. And it's really uh, a synthesis of our most popular courses. So mm -hmm. we saw again and again, the biggest impact we could make within organizations that were limited in time and money uh, is focusing on really accelerating the effectiveness of managers. Um, mm -hmm. And so, of course, we do that through our workshops where we're focusing on skill building, but we wanted to make a book accessible as well, both to our our clients, but also to people who don't have access to our training or whether they mm -hmm. can't afford it or they're not quite ready for it. Um, we just wanted to kind of democratize access to these skills and tools because we see the incredible difference that it makes very quickly. And to the point of your, uh, the, the whole theme of your podcast, both in work and in life. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the key, I mean, I, I remember when I looked at your website, the thing that really struck me was, you know, instructions for human kindness is actually mm -hmm. the first thing I saw when I landed on your website. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, the whole leader lab is all about you know, being empath empathetic, compassionate leaders mm -hmm. um, to in order to improve business. Tell me a little bit about, you know, what do you, what are the common issues or challenges you see in the businesses that you work with in the leadership or management teams? Mm, yeah. Well, so for some context, the companies we work with, we work with organizations all around the world of various sizes, but the thing that they tend to have in common is there's a lot of uncertainty, um, both mm. positive and negative. Either they're growing very quickly or things are changing around them very quickly. Uh, and what we notice is incredibly often the challenge is just the managers uh, who are kind of chucked into these roles don't quite know how to do the job well. Um, they want to, the intentions are there, but yeah. there isn't clarity around what does this role look like when it's done really well. Yeah. And so the biggest and kind of in many ways, simplest challenge we wanted to address is how do we give managers, how do we simplify the complexity of it? How do we give them the tools, the vocabulary, the habits to be able to be multipliers? Because that's the point of a manager. Oftentimes we forget that. You're not meant to be like, you know, a controller, which is, you know, a, a synonym for manager. You're, ideally, you're not just overseeing people and telling them what to do. You are having this one plus one equals three effect where yes. the work that you're doing with others accelerates and amplifies their effectiveness. So number one thing we wanted to do is just figure out, all right, how do we take people who are feeling overwhelmed, who either have not enough experience or not enough experience 
managing in this kind of environment and give them those tools that are going to set them up for success. And we both, Leanne and I have a background in psychology. And so we started off by doing research on what are the specific skills that distinguish great managers. Um, and then we broke those skills down into what we call behavioral units. So what are the tiny actions, kind of micro actions that result in, you know, strong performance, commitment, engagement, passion. Uh, and that's what the book is. And that's what the training that we do as well. Fantastic. So I think I've seen this with some of the people's businesses that I work with. People often get promoted because they've been there for a long time mm -hmm. or because they're just the, the natural person. Or, or with all the family businesses, it might be a family member who comes in and takes on a role. Um, or it can just be that somebody has actually started a business quite early on, shown some potential, and they want to take them up to a management level. But it's very, very different sort of, you know, you know doing things versus managing and leading people, isn't it? And mm -hmm. I think that's what you're saying is that people, you know, go out and get thrown into this, but they haven't been given the skills to actually actually Absolutely. be the most effective leader and manager. And oftentimes there's no correlation between, actually I would say usually there's no correlation between <laughs> being really good at doing your job yeah. as an individual contributor. I don't know, maybe I'm doing sales or engineering and then supporting others in achieving results. It's actually an entirely different skill set. I mean, they, they really, there's very little parallel between them. Uh, and so partially it, one of the challenges is sometimes individuals who don't even want to be doing the job of a manager end up being in the job of a manager. Um, and then yeah. even if they do want to be doing it, it's not even like, absolutely, they need the skills. But before that, they don't even know what the job description is. So mm -hmm. even just starting off with saying at our, at our organization, what is the purpose of a manager? You know, what does it look like when it's done well? What are some of the results that you're looking to achieve? Uh, and truly, if you do that well, we'd still love to work with you, but you won't need us nearly as much <laughs> because <laughs> so much of the pain is just, well, what the heck is a manager? And and also yeah. it's just, you know, again, the, the, the world around us is changing so quickly. What success was for a manager 20 years ago, 10 years ago might be different than what success is and what expectations are today. So I think it's just a really important thing to not take for granted that that expectation needs to be clear. Hmm. So how does an organization know that they're perhaps not doing things as well as they could be? What are the signs hmm. that you might see that says, hey, the wheels are falling off? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll say the what does it look like when the wheels are falling off? And then maybe what does it look like when the wheels are creaking? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. Yep. <laughs> well, I love to hear from people when they're just starting to notice the creaks, not when the wheels sure. are down, down the motorway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the wheels falling off, we see things like, people quitting, you see this, either they're literally quitting or they're kind of quitting in place where they've, they've checked out. Uh, you yep. see, you know, really unproductive conflict, healthy conflict can be a wonderful thing, but conflict that gets tied up in ego and defensiveness and, you know, people feeling disrespected, things like that, um, mm -hmm. having a really hard time hiring. Uh, and so, you know, your business is really constrained in its ability to achieve anything. Um, and then oftentimes, this is somewhere between a wheel falling off and a creek uh, is the, the founders or the, the leaders just being incredibly overwhelmed and burnt out and underwater because they can't rely on their team. They can't achieve the results and the, the hopes and dreams that they have by being able to leverage the power of the group. They're just putting everything on their shoulders and feeling burnt out and feeling exhausted and feeling frustrated and irritated and things like that. Um, the earlier signs are things like uh, an over-reliance on managers, for example. That's one that people mm. often don't pick up. You know, managers often feel great being problem solvers. You come to them with a question, they give you an answer, you walk away happy, they walk away happy. And that for us is actually a, a really um, important red flag uh, mm. because ideally what happens when a manager has someone come to them with a problem is they don't give them an answer. They ask them questions and they help them figure out that solution on their own so that the person leaves not with an answer, but with a skill set, an improved skill set in finding that answer on their own. It's um, that whole teach the man to fish rather than fish for him. Yeah, right? yeah. exactly. And, and oftentimes it's not even, it's not even about direct mentorship. It's just being kind of a, uh, someone who's there to help them even work through what is the problem? Mm. You know, it's, it's like, what am I actually thinking? You know? Uh, yeah. And so it's that, um, you know, other, other red flags or creaky wheels or things like avoiding difficult conversations. Uh, another one might be everyone feeling that they're constantly overwhelmed and busy. 
really big red flag. <laughs> and uh, uh, we can't get done. We can't get to those things because there are too many things that are high urgency, high importance. Uh, so things slip, slipping through the cracks or, or people getting all the things done and then just being incredibly exhausted and burnt out. Yeah. Okay. I'm just making a few notes of those. That's really interesting. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm sure that a few people are listening here now and saying, oh, yes, we've got a few of those things going on. Um, I know that, I know I've certainly seen it not only in my own businesses when, I, when I've when i employed sort of staff and whatnot, but also in businesses that I work with. And and I think that the the busyness, the, um, mm. the, you know, we've got too many things, like you said, that are too urgent or too important. We just haven't got time to do anything else um, is, is a real um, red flag in terms of okay, this is not this is not good. <laughs> and it's, yeah. a, it's a tricky flag too because you, while you're in the midst of the busyness, you can feel really productive. You can feel frustrated. Mm-hmm. You can feel anxious, but you can feel really productive and really good about yourself, especially if yep. you cross those hundred things off your to do list. Tick, tick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So in many ways, it's a problem that everyone feels. Uh, really, I mean, even we hear it from from founders, from executives. I don't have time. I have too much on my plate, but you're the one putting it on your plate. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, and and time uh, ideally isn't something very much like management. I'm coming to believe more and more that people shouldn't manage people. They should sort of, you know, work in partnership with people. And I'm thinking Mm -hmm. the same way about time. You shouldn't try to manage time and control time as though it's your enemy. You should really be kind of befriending time and collaborating with the time that you have. Uh, but everywhere we look, there's this kind of adversarial relationship people have with time. They're like, oh, right. I want more of it. And it's <laughs> things aren't going the way I want. And so there's this chronic sense of strain and stress and an urgency. Um, and again, it's, it's fascinating because in many ways, we're we're putting ourselves in those situations because we're the ones putting those things on our to-do lists. Even the mm-hmm. individuals with most power in the organization feel that amount of strain. And if you imagine the individuals who have less and less and less power throughout the organization, they feel it even more. Yeah. So what's the first step to kind of um, tackling some of these things? So let's just say you're sitting here and you're going, you're recognizing, going, yes, we've definitely got those issues in our organization. What would you suggest is the first step um, towards making a difference? Yeah. So when it comes to the, uh, the, the issue of over-reliance, you know, when, mm-hmm. when people are constantly coming to you, uh, whether you're a manager or an executive within your organization, the thing that we found in our research was actually what I was kind of getting or hinting at earlier is um, managers who stand out as most effective have a much, much higher question to answer ratio than managers who are seen as average uh, in terms of uh, ratings uh, from their direct reports. And so literally one of the things we found in our research is we would see a conversation, one-on-one conversation between a manager and their direct report. And managers who are, again, seen as most effective, they're asking about 10 questions in a 15-minute interval. On average, you're seeing about two questions per 15-minute interval. And we did this across several different countries. It varies somewhat, but really the ratio piece is still there. Uh, So as strange as it sounds, the first step is really actually starting to take more off of your own shoulders and place the responsibility or the power of problem solving, of thinking things through, of figuring things out onto other individuals. Um, And it's actually... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go, go, go ahead, Chef. Sorry. Go. Well, I was going to say, um, um, what that does is it essentially, it, it takes the, the power of problem solving and it takes it out of this like small bunched up cluster of the small number of people who can figure things out on their own, both in terms of skill and confidence. And mm-hmm. it spreads it, it like sets it free across the entire organization, which means that in, a, in, in kind of an indirect way, but very quickly, workload becomes distributed as well as decision making becomes distributed. So now I not only have uh, less to do, but I also have less to decide uh, and I have the power to make high quality decisions about what's most important. I think we kind of use the terminology of accountability in our um, in our EOS world, where we you know we actually sort of say, "Hey, look, actually that that's your accountability according to our accountability chart," and so you actually mm-hmm. encourage the person to to try to find the answers themselves yeah. by asking questions and things, by helping them, by supporting them, rather than yeah. trying to do it for them. But it's really tough because um, mm-hmm. I, I have to confess, I'm a wee bit of a control freak. Uh, <laughs> I'm half I'm half German, so I like things to be done properly, <laughs> and so often yeah, you know, there's this tendency to kind of go, "Ah, oh, but it's just so much quicker to do it myself." than to try and help somebody else. So how would you... Yeah, I was going to, anticipating your question, 
I mean, there's a few different ways to go about it. One is to, you know, try to change. The other is don't try to change and just collaborate with your inner control freak and go, yeah, actually, if I do want control, if I do want really good results, um, then actually it behooves me to think about what do I have to do to actually allow that to happen, not just today, but over the long haul and not just with a team of two people, but with a team of 200 people, you know, 300 people, you truly can't achieve excellent results by holding on too tightly. That's the great paradox of it all. (laughs) So it's, you know, it's, it's actually asking yourself, you know, what is, uh, if I truly am the kind of person who wants to make sure that the results are excellent, then what is the scalable way to get there? You can Mm. be a solopreneur. You can do the, all the things on your own. As soon as you want to be able to leverage, you know, the effectiveness or the power that happens when you get a group together, that's where control starts to happen by giving up control in many ways. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we, we actually teach our, our clients, you know, um, about letting go of the vine and just allowing mm-hmm. other people to step up. And, you know, it's about having systems and processes and measurables and having to be able to um, have those conversations mm-hmm. with people. But can we try and use an example? So let's just say um, an employee comes over and I'm the manager and they say to me, oh, look, um, I'm struggling with this um, can you tell me what to do? How yeah. would you then put that back onto them? What's the sort of the, the techniques you might use? Yeah, I love that question. Well, the first thing I would consider is, do they actually have the information to solve it on their own? You know, mm-hmm. if, uh, sometimes I'll use the example of like, if I don't, if I come to your office and I don't work there and I say, where's the bathroom? It doesn't help me for you to go, where do you think the bathroom is? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a great coaching <laughs> opportunity. Um, however, if <laughs> someone is coming to me and asking about their project work that they're really close to, that is a wonderful coaching moment. So mm. I'm going to kind of split it out just really quickly into two. One is the internal work we have to do as leaders. Again, my co-founder, Leanne, one of the things that she used to study was something that's going to sound unrelated, but I promise it is. So she used to study taxi drivers in New York City and and trying to figure out why is it the taxi drivers honk, even if it doesn't make a difference. I don't know if you've ever, I bet New Zealand does not have this problem. No, we don't. And I'm thinking, I've not been to New York, but I, I, but I have I have lived in London, so I, I can probably okay, understand yeah, a little yeah. bit of uh, also India. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Imagine any 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 of those places where there's just a, this constant barrage of honking, and you know sometimes you use it to warn someone, but usually you're doing it out of frustration. And so they mm-hmm. tried all these interventions to try to reduce honking, and what they found was the most effective way to get taxi drivers to stop honking is to label what they call the honk urge. So the moment they felt the urge to honk, they would just go, okay, I want to honk. And that would pause them just long enough not to do it. (laughs) And so going back to managers, number one, if someone's coming to me with a problem, the first thing I have to do is label that honk urge within myself to solve the problem for them. Mm -hmm. That instant, you know, if you think about it from a neuropsychology perspective, I'm going to get that dopamine burst of, you know, success, quick win. Yeah. Like, boom, I solved it for you. I feel like a hero. It's great. So I have to just label it, you know, whatever word you use, you know, works. Um, for, for me, Mm -hmm. I go coaching moment (laughs) inside Mm -hmm. my own head. Sometimes I say it out loud. So that's number one (laughs) is like reducing that, that urge to problem solve. So then, uh, number two, once you start actually working with the individual, I would say even before you think about, well, how do I ask really thoughtful probing questions? It's just, what we find is getting people to talk out loud through their own problem Mm -hmm. allows them to actually understand the problem better and solve the problem faster. There's this concept in neuropsychology called spreading activation, which is essentially what happens when you say you start talking through something out loud and more and more parts of your brain essentially go online and get activated. Mm -hmm. And just talking out loud, this works for extroverts and introverts. Even if you're listening, you're like, I hate talking out loud. I need to, you know, talk things through. It works in writing as well. Um, But talking out loud works for introverts and extroverts. So the first thing I would do is say, you know, tell me more about, you know, tell me more about the problem. Walk me through it. Uh, I would do what we call playbacks and split tracks. So playback is just, you know, our version of essentially like a a repeat back. I like the word playback Mm -hmm. because you imagine yourself sort of winding back the tape and go, okay, so I think I heard you say this. Did I get that right? A split track is what we call teasing apart if there are different tracks to what the individual is saying. Mm -hmm. So often they'll say something like, oh, I have this project and I'm really stressing out. I'm not sure how to start it. And the deadline doesn't even seem realistic. And so I I don't even know if I should be working on it now or later, blah, blah, blah. So I might pause and go, okay, it sounds like I heard two things. One is 
sounds like you're not quite sure where to start. And the other is, it sounds like you're questioning the deadline. Which of those should we talk about first? So number one, get the person talking, then get them to a place where they've heard themselves through that playback. Make sure you've kind of teased apart the different strands of that problem so it's clear which problem you're solving. And then the other tip that I'll throw out there is um, we use a a coaching framework. There are many out there. The one that I really like is the one we made up uh, and it's called the soon (laughs) funnel. (laughs) It's called the soon funnel as in you'll get to the solution soon. Uh, And it stands for success, obstacles, options, next steps. So in that situation, I might say something like, well, what would success look like for this project? And that's a really important place to start because it is incredibly easy for us, especially when we're stressed, to just focus on the problem. And that can really get you into tactics mode versus what's the objective, what's the strategy. So what does success look like? Whatever they mm-hmm. tell me, okay, so what's standing in the way? What are the obstacles? What's what's holding you up? And then we go to options, yep. we brainstorm, we generate ideas, and then finally ne- next steps. So, okay, we've just talked through the all the options you have which of those are most, you know, viable, what do you want to do next? And so throughout this entire conversation, all I'm doing is sort of amplifying the effectiveness of their mind and their problem solving. At no point do I actually have to tell them what to do. And ultimately they get to a solution quicker and they walk away with better problem solving skills. I absolutely love it. Soon. Okay. The soon fun. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to go back a little step because I, I heard you say that, you know, this talking out loud works for both extroverts and introverts. And my understanding of extroversion versus introversion, certainly according to Myers-Briggs, is not about how, whether you're the life and soul of the party, but it's about how you actually tend to solve issues. And so I'm an extrovert in terms of I tend to talk things out in order to get to the solution. My husband is an absolute introvert. And so everything is kind of processed in his head first before anything comes out. So how do how do the introverts cope with this talking out loud? Because to me, it seems it seems counterintuitive. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and I guess I'm not as familiar with Myers Briggs, but you know, kind of the the, the aspects I'm familiar with are kind of verbal processing versus mm-hmm. in, internal processing. So the idea here is, ideally, you're getting a person to a place where they can verbalize what's going on. It doesn't mean that that's the first step. So the first step could be you ask a question, you go take your time. If you want to write it out or I'll ask you a question now, let's talk about it tomorrow. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, or ideally I ask you and I say, how how can I be most helpful? Do you want to talk through it right now? Do you want me to, you know, share with you some ways that I could recommend thinking about it? And then we'll pick up the conversation tomorrow. Ideally, you're kind of calibrating with the person so that they can Mm -hmm. let you know what's the most helpful way to work together. Um, So the goal is not to force someone into talking out loud uh, right there on the spot. It might be that they just need anything from, you know, 30 seconds to just think about it before they answer to maybe they want to sleep on it and come back and continue the Mm -hmm. conversation if the situation allows for that kind of time. Time frame, yeah. Okay, so what you're saying is you're you're giving you you're not saying right we are going to talk about it because we're right now, but it's more about um, actually setting the 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 expectations or the boundaries around what works Mm -hmm. for them. And you talked about writing things down. I know that certainly especially with difficult conversations. I find mm-hmm. that actually writing things down beforehand just gets some clarity oh, around yes. what you're wanting to talk about as well. Okay, Absolutely. cool. So so use the soon funnel. Look at what the success looks like, um, explore all the obstacles, come up with some options, and then the next steps. Got Loving it. it. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Hey, um, so that's a great sort of first step. What other what are other things can we pick your brains on while we've got you on the show? <laughs> what are the other kind of common mistakes you see and that could, you know, you could offer a little bit of advice oh, around? Yeah. So maybe I'll go on to feedback next since that is yes. such a pain point, especially when you're working cross-culturally uh, and in remote and hybrid, meaning some people mm-hmm. are in person, some people, uh, some people are virtual situations. That is a real pain point. Without feedback skills, without feedback comfort, you just see learning just crawl <laughs> you know yeah. It, yeah it's so difficult to be able to be responsive and agile without being able to very quickly go you know this thing that you did here's the impact that it's having and then either great that's it's positive and i do more of that or whoops there's an issue there and we have to calibrate and, and course correct um so it is such i can't stress enough the the value of it to be able to be this agile high performing environment um not to mention to be able to 
you know, it's, a, it's hard collaborating. And if we can't talk about what works for us, what doesn't work for us, then we're kind of feeling stuck together and miserable, but we don't know how to fix it. So feedback skills to the rescue. Um, so to your point about writing things down, one of the things that we teach people is a really simple framework for writing out your feedback that you want to deliver. And then delivering it ideally live. Uh, you know, some feedback I think could be delivered in writing. There is research that shows, though, that we tend to perceive written communication as more negative than live communication. I don't know if you've ever gotten an email where you're like, email, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you're reading it, and you're like, that person is, hates me, or this person is horrible. Yeah. And then you talk to them afterwards, and they're like, no, that's not how I meant it. It was totally yeah. neutral. So we do I think I'm actually guilty of that because of being half German, I tend to kind of be very blunt on my emails. And yeah. sometimes people come back and they're like, you know, what did I do to upset you? It's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, your email was so blunt. Oh, I am just was busy. Sorry. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes. I've, I've, I've seen I've, early on in my career, I facilitated this kind of conflict resolution conversation between two branches of a company, one in the US and one in Latin America, and they had completely different cultural norms around greetings for their emails. So oh. in the US, it would, and, I, and it, it depends on where in the US, obviously, but they would sure. say things like, you know, Debra, uh, I'd like to check in on the status of that report. You said you were going to get it to me and you haven't yet. In Latin America, they would say, oh, Deborah, how are you doing? Isn't the weather wonderful? And how have you been? And how's your family? Oh, by the way, there was that report I'm still waiting on. <laughs> so <laughs> a completely different approach to communication. And they, instead of seeing it as, you know, it's a communication style thing, they were going, you don't respect me or you don't mm. see me, you don't value me, things like that. So, wow. Yep. Definitely uh, what we recommend is, especially if the conversation can be sensitive, it is so valuable to have it live, you know, virtually or, or in person, in person um, yeah. but write it down first. Actually, so many people miss that step. What they do with feedback conversations is generally they either avoid them or they avoid them and avoid them and avoid them until they just kind of blow up and they say things that aren't fully thought out. And, you know, when we're saying things from a place of that kind of frustration, then of course the individual hearing it is going to hear it from, you know, in a, in a very defensive way. And so I'll just quickly share the model that we use uh, to help people craft a better feedback message, if you'd like. Yes, please. You know, I'm, okay. I'm all ears. <laughs> uh, so we start off with uh, what we call a micro yes what we noticed, again, observing managers who were seen again and again, not just managers, actually, we looked at anyone in the workplace who had the best reputation for giving effective feedback. We monitored mm -hmm. what was it that they were doing behaviorally. And we noticed this micro skill of starting with a micro yes. Uh, and so instead of just saying, hey, look, this, this, here's a thing you did, they would start with, hey, can I share some feedback with you about how that conversation went? Or, hey, I, I noticed something during that meeting that I'd love to, you know, kind of debrief about? Would you be open to having a conversation about it? So that already makes the conversation so much more likely to be successful because the person sure. is, you know, hopefully they take a moment to, to consider, is this a good time for it? Do, am I ready for this conversation? Do I want to hear this message? Once they say yes, they're also in a, in a state of collaboration versus mm. defensiveness. So there's the micro yes, which by the way, should not be, can we talk that is not a good micro yes <laughs> for anyone yeah. on anything. So number one is that micro yes. Hey, can I share some feedback with you about how that meeting went? Uh, the next is the behavior. So what was it that you actually noticed? One of the things uh, that we really try to focus on at Life Ops Learning and in the book, The Leader Lab, we talk a lot about the skill of de-blurring. So often our communication is very rich with blur words, words that could mean different things to different people. So a blurry piece of feedback might be something like, Hey, I noticed that you weren't paying attention during that meeting. What does that mean? Not paying attention. How do I know? And, and right away, even though it sounds kind of innocuous, most likely people are going to get at least somewhat defensive. And so yes. blur word free behavior would be something like, Hey, I noticed that during the meeting, you checked your phone a few times. Right. So that's behavior. So quite specific. As ideally specific, um, and yeah. that probably speak, you know resonates with the German aspect of your communication style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have a German coworker who will say things like, "I was monitoring you during that meeting, and you checked your phone four times." <laughs> okay, that's not so good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be that specific, but, but ideally, yeah. I know what you're talking about. And and when he but does, not like, ambiguous, so not yes. so not something that could be misconstrued, which exactly. is the deblurring thing. Yeah. yeah, and ideally taking the judgment out of it, right? So not sure. you weren't paying attention, but. I noticed this thing. Uh, yeah. Then 
step three is what's the impact? Uh, so you've got micro yes, behavior and impact. Impact is, you know, I mention it because I found myself getting really distracted. Um, and you could even, you know, you can even say, maybe that's on me, but I wanted to bring it up because I, I was hoping we can come up with some, a solution. Or maybe the impact is, um, I mentioned it because uh, I noticed that then other people started taking out their phones and I ended up having to repeat myself a few times because people missed the, the information that I shared. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't really efficient. So whatever that impact statement is. And then finally, ideally you end with a question. And so that could be something like, you know, what are your thoughts? Um, <laughs> what do you think about that? Or, you know, moving forward, or would you be up for experimenting with a different way of doing it? Um, and the same goes for positive feedback. So it might be something like, Hey, can I share some feedback with you about that presentation? I, I noticed that you went around and asked everyone their perspective. And I mentioned that because we got to hear from everyone in the room. And I think that really led us to have much better ideas at the end how'd you do that? You know, or, or, you know, what, what, what helped you remember to check in with everyone? Um, that mm -hmm. question at the end is so valuable because that's the piece that takes feedback from the past and moves you into the future and helps you both mm -hmm. repeat and build on the things that are working well and tweak or change the things that aren't working well. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. So the micro, yes, what's the behavior notice? What's the impact? And then a question to finish it off. I yeah. have to ask this question, though, yes. because what happens if they say no when you have the, you know, the micro, yes, question? Oh, it's my favorite part. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think that's wonderful because it means, you know, so maybe I'll say, hey, can I give you some feedback on the last podcast episode? And yeah. You know, and you go, oh, you know what? I'm just not, I had the kind of day where I don't think I'm going to process it well. I can go, thank you for telling me that. You know, what? when would be a good time for us to talk about it? Um, right. I would say throughout my whole career with the hundreds of micro yeses I've, I've, I've used, I've probably gotten, I don't know, maybe five to 10 no's. In almost okay. all of those cases, it was just about, okay, so when can we talk about it? Uh, mm -hmm. I think that in one case, there was someone who was like, I just don't want that feedback. And so it was <laughs> my opportunity to go, well, how important is it? How significant is the impact? Like, is this going to harm me or harm others or harm the individual's career? Then I'm going to go, mm -hmm. well, I do have to share it with you, but you let me know what's the best Maybe time to do it. What's the best place to do it? Uh, otherwise I can go, you know what, if you don't want it, that is okay because that's going <laughs> to save me some time. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, yeah. and, and that's good so it's about prioritizing for you you know what the the impact of not giving that feedback would actually be yeah brilliant hey um i usually have this quite a bit more structure and say can we have three top tips we're kind of getting there we've got the soon funnel we've got the feedback thing what's the yeah. third thing give me something oh, else okay, okay. <laughs> um okay well so i'll uh man I'm, I'm so torn okay i'll 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 end with just one of my favorite tools from yep. our um work on helping people develop prioritization skills. This is a really, really mm. small, easy one. It's something called the MIT method, most important thing. And it is as easy as starting your day by going, what is my MIT? What yes. is that one thing that I want to get done today? And it sounds, you know, kind of silly simple, but what we find is that when people don't ask that question, you either do the thing that is right in front of you because you're too tired to even think about it. Maybe you mm -hmm. do the thing that's really easy because you want that dopamine hit, that quick win, uh, the <laughs> thing that someone who stresses you out asked you for. And so you have all of these decision criteria that are not actually linked to what is truly most important for your organization. And so mm -hmm. it could be that you use this tool yourself and you go, what are, what's my MIT today? You could use it on a team level. Um, so with, with my team, we actually write it out in our one-on-one -on -one documents so that we have kind of clearly clear alignment on what are our most important things. And oftentimes we'll actually write out and here are the things that we will not do until the most uh. important things are done. <laughs> so what is your oh, like, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> your, counter, your, your do not do list. Um, and you can also do it on an organization wide level, which I think is incredibly powerful to be able to say as a company, here is our MIT. Everything mm -hmm. else is less important than this one thing. And going back to the conversation we were talking about with wheels falling off and people quitting and deadlines being missed and burnout, um, it, so much of that stems from the lack of certainty and clarity around what is the most important thing. Uh, and so that tiny tool, it can work on a micro level or on a macro level. 
it's really interesting because obviously with the work we do we, we very much want to have a laser sharp focus on what the most important things are and we said our 90 day rocks and and we're always saying you know less is more um, yeah. and I know that as as humans we, we naturally sort of want to do more but it's actually if everything's important nothing is important yeah and and I see companies who get you know that you can see the, the staff are working so hard and they're they are overwhelmed and they are completely stressed it's because they're trying to do too much yeah. um, and if they could just prioritize with that one most important thing you know yeah. then they, I think it would make a huge difference and it yeah. takes courage you know it takes some courage to go I'm gonna not mm-hmm. I'm not going to do everything I'm really going to commit it's almost like getting married right like yeah. there's a fair <laughs> commitment there what if I do this most important thing and it ends up not being the most useful thing so mm-hmm. I you know the, but the research does support what you're saying it, organizations that have fewer priorities consistently outperform in terms of revenue growth organizations with a larger number of priorities and I think that's because it allows you to focus and and have depth mm-hmm. and learn more quickly so maybe you did choose the wrong thing but at yeah. least you go and run in that direction and then you can learn quite quickly that you chose the wrong thing and then that's okay you can that change can it change. and do something else yeah. and otherwise you're just constantly constantly suffering but the thing I actually also really like about your MIT is that also that that anti to do list. So what are the things you're not going to do until it's done? Because I must admit, I am hugely easily distracted. And so even <laughs> yeah. if I've got my most important things, oh, well, I might just do this, this and this and this first and then come yeah. back to it. Um, but if I can actually go, hmm, OK, what am I not going to do until that's done? I think that would actually motivate me to get things done. Yeah. So, right. That's, that's almost it. like Thank you. you have to have your, your vegetables and then you get your dessert in some ways. Yes, <laughs> it is. Yeah. In an adult version. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So I'm assuming these kind of things are talked about in your book or yep. uh, how do how do people find out more because I mean the stuff we talked about today is just absolutely invaluable but if they want to find out more about it where would they go yep so if you want the you know get it within the next 48 hours version uh, you can get our book again it's called the yep. leader lab core skills to become a great manager faster uh, if you are interested in training for your organization we do all of these workshops you know, live both through both uh, live workshops and digital kind of nudges and practice uh, intensives and things like that. And so our website is lifelabslearning.com. Wonderful. Hey, look, um, I, I have really, really enjoyed our conversation today. Likewise. If people wanted to get in contact with you personally, how do they get in contact with you? How do they, I mean, I, I you can Google you, I think, and you can find you pretty easily. Right. But yep. I am Googleable, uh, or you yep. can go to my website, which is tanyaluna.com, T A N I A. Luna, L-U-N-A dot com. Okay. That's fantastic. Hey, look, again, thank you so, so much for your time. I really appreciate everything that you've shared. Um, congratulations on what you did with the, the Life Labs Learning as well. I mean, that is a no mean feat to get, well, you and your co-founder, of course, to get to where you got to. So um, congratulations on that. Um, I know that you're uh, writing a new book, aren't you? So you want to yes. tell us a little bit about that before we finish up? Oh, sure. Well, yes, depending on when you listen to this, uh, this will be either in the far future or the or the past. Uh, it is called <laughs> Power With, and it uh, comes out in September of 2023. Uh, yep. And it is the book focused on how to distribute power well in the workplace. Uh, it is yeah. written in a very different format than my other two books. It is, okay. uh, I'm calling it philosophical fiction. Uh, I think that, I think my editor is calling it a business parable, uh, yeah. but it's sort of like fictionalized uh, story that I was really excited to try out as a format because there's so much research that shows that we learn better and remember things better through story than just yeah. through, you know, the facts. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's again, power with and uh, yeah, I've, I'm coming out in September. Yeah. I have to say, um, Patrick Lencioni is one of my favorite kind oh. of authors because he does exactly that. He does the business um, fable thing with with meaning in behind it. And I just find them such an easy read. But also, as you said, it sticks in your mind more the, the message that he wants to get across. That's what I'm hoping. Thank yeah. you for saying yeah. that. Yeah. No, no, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I'm, uh, it's just one person, but I tell you, I love those kind of things. So I'm looking forward to it. Look forward to seeing that in September. Again, thanks for your time. Look forward to um, yeah. following you with interest and, and hopefully catching up and seeing your goats and your cats and your your dogs and all the things you've got in your rescue yard there. I hope to visit your wonderful country where there are no snakes and no and no poisonous spiders. So yeah, uh, yeah, we'll, no, it's we'll best, the best country in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, lovely. Thanks very much, Tanya.